There is a familiar phrase that is often spoken on a Good Friday service. You may be familiar with it, but not its origin. S.M. Lockridge, a pastor in San Diego, California, Calvary Baptist Church for over 40 years. S.M. stands for Shadrach Meshach. He was going to be a pastor from the beginning, wasn't he? S.M. Lockridge, in a Good Friday service, started this phrase, I dearly love and appreciate. It is Friday, but Sunday's coming. What a great word. Welcome, church, to South Haven in our Good Friday service. Though we look forward to a Resurrection Sunday coming here in just a few days, we get to have an experience tonight that prepares the heart and the mind and helps us to embed the message of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And all of that is embodied tonight. So we begin. Heavenly Father, we know that you are in this place. We know that you have orchestrated and ordained this moment in time. You have gathered a group of people, Father, from around our community and from different places around the state and other states, and even those that are streaming with us online right now for this moment in time. So it reminds us again, Father, that we are here on a Friday evening, chose to be here uh, in, in order to get a, a sense of who you are, a, an affirmation of what we know, and Father, to know that you have something to say. So when we put all that together and we realize that we're in the presence of God, in the house of God, among the people of God, all of a sudden we understand that the voice of God is about to speak powerful truth into our lives. And so, Father, this moment and this night, this time is yours. Amen. Jesus was troubled in his spirit and he testified, I assure you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples started looking at one another, uncertain which one he was speaking about. And one of the disciples, the one Jesus loved, was reclining close beside Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him to find out who it was he was talking about. So he leaned back against Jesus and he asked him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus replied, He's the one I give the piece of bread to after I've dipped it. And when he had dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. And after Judas ate the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Therefore Jesus told him, what you're about to go do, go and do quickly. And none of those reclining at the table knew why he had told him this, because Jesus had sometimes kept the money bag, and some, some thought that Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the festival or perhaps he was saying go and give something to the poor and after receiving the piece of bread he went out immediately and it was night stand with us Broken and poured out of 
went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them sit here while I go over there and pray he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled then he said to them my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death stay here and keep watch for me Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing.
while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd of armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with the swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him in and fled.
Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answers. Then Pilate asked him, Do you not hear the testimony that they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not a single charge, and to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's customer, custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So the crowd had gathered and Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Abbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. And while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I then do with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? Messiah, Pilate answered. And they all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the more louder, Crucify him! And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. And all the people answered, His blood is on us and our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Stop. 
As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. 
since you are under the, sum, the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. 
About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. When the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God.
Himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains but we in turn regarded him stricken struck down by God and afflicted but he was pierced because of our rebellion crushed because of our iniquities punished for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds and we all went astray like sheep we all have turned to our own way and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all those prophetic words speak about Jesus and they come from the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah approximately 700 years before the crucifixion these words, this worship, the scripture, the story that has been told culminate and remind us of some simple truths tonight. We need to be reminded of this truth. We are all sinners by nature and by choice. Isaiah compares you and me to sheep. We go astray. We turn to our own way, just like sheep. Sheep are directionless. They tend to wander. They're aimless. Like sheep, we're born with that very nature. And as we mature, we make that very choice to wander, to go away. Robert Robinson's wonderful hymn speaks of this powerful truth Come thou fount of every blessing. What a wonderful word. In the midst of that hymn, he writes, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. We're all prone to wander. That is a truth that has been described for us tonight. Here's the second truth. Our sin must be really bad. 
Nothing reveals how severe our sin is like a cross. A cross reveals the severity of the gap of the separation that is between man and a holy God. Our sins must be bad if the penalty is death. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 Jesus took our place, though, in death. He was made sin who did not know sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. If there was no other way for a righteous God to forgive an unrighteous people except that he should bear our sin in Christ on the cross, our sin must be really bad. The punishment fits the crime is what we must say here's a third truth we need to be reminded of tonight God's love is more wonderful than you can imagine I've just painted a very grim picture for us to come back and say what does that mean God's love is more wonderful than we can imagine because God could have left us in our sin God could have said, this is what you deserve. You deserve what you've gotten yourself into. It's what we deserve, but he chose not to do that. Because of his love, he came after us. He pursued us all the way to the cross. The Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, speaking directly of Jesus. So it's, here, think about it for just a moment because it takes a really hard heart to be unmoved by this kind of love. I want you to think about it. It is a really hard, obstinate heart that refuses to be moved by someone who says, I love you so much that I will go and die for you. The Apostle Paul, a murderer, a persecutor of Christians, knew about this kind of love, this kind of grace, when he says that God or Jesus has demonstrated or proved his own love for us. He's proved that he's loved you. In that while you were a sinner, Jesus died for you. Romans 5, 8. I like to think of that passage of Scripture, that beautiful word that reminds us that while we are here, it it reminds me of this, while I, while you, while humanity was at its very worst, And you think about humanity being at their very worst. God says, I'm going to give you my very best. While you're at your worst, he gave him, you and me, his very best. So when we come, considering all these things and everything that has drawn us to this moment and to this table that is here, that's what that's about. We come tonight at the end of our service tonight to come to a table and remember what Jesus has done for us. Our deacons right now will be serving here and momentarily they are making their ways to the back to take their places. Let's be reminded as we begin to participate in this Lord's Supper tonight. Let's remember his punishment for our sin. Tonight we will do two passes. The communion wafer will come first. It's in a cup. You just reach and grab a cup as it comes your way. After you receive the elements, I'll come back and give us some instruction on how to participate together tonight. If you're not a member of South Haven that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is, that is the qualifier tonight. We invite you to participate. You don't have to be a member here. You just have Jesus in your life. So momentarily, as we begin this process, let's begin to prayerfully consider what God has done for us. Our deacons are making their way forward right now to prepare the table and begin to distribute to you. And as they come forward, I want you to begin to consider in your mind and begin to even be thankful. I want you to think of a person 
I want you to think of a church, a place, someone who God used that was instrumental in you coming to know Christ. And I want you to begin thanking the Lord for that person or those people or that church or whomever it may be. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Christ. Alpha, Omega. Ancient of Days. Bread of life, living water. Sovereign God. Emmanuel. God with us, King of glory. Lion of the tribe of Judah. Lamb of God. Cornerstone, Commander. Sacrifice. Jesus Christ. Lamb of God. Who takes away the sins of the world? But they did not know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus.
Apostle Paul was giving instruction to the church at Corinth regarding this moment and this Lord's Supper. Here is the instruction from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, and on the night that when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember and take and eat. Father, thank you for the body of Christ that was given up on our behalf. For the wounds, for the pain, for the brokenness, so that we may live. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus the Christ. Mediator, promise of the covenant. Salvation, source of the hope we possess. Image of God. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cried out again. It is finished, and Jesus breathes his last. And one of the soldiers pierced his side, and out came blood and water. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and our sorrows he carried. He was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb to slaughter and like a sheep silent before its shearers, he himself bore our sins. Jesus, Redeemer. Jesus, spotless blameless, 
just. Christ, perfecter of our faith. Jesus Christ, our Savior. scriptures remind us that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin the cup in which you hold represents the blood of Jesus Christ we're remembering the shed blood the sacrifice of the Lamb of God so the Apostle Paul gave instructions as well and this is what he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me take and drink Once again, Father, we are grateful, mindful, hopeful, and Father, with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, there is a powerfulness that comes from you. It is resurrection power. Father, the resurrection power that we are about to experience, know, celebrate in just a few hours. Father, today, tonight, all seems dark and gloom. All seems hopeless. Oh, but we thought. Oh, but we wished. Oh, but it did. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for resurrection power. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.